Well, hello everybody and a very warm welcome to this month's webinar. What we're going to be looking at in this webinar is the 10 biggest mistakes that business owners make with their websites. Okay, And these are the 10 mistakes which I've chosen on the basis of speaking with literally thousands of business owners um, and one of the most popular topics we talk about is websites and why websites aren't working. Um, so I've distilled down the 10 mistakes that people make. However, I don't want you to believe this is going to be a negative webinar, because what I'm not going to tell you is the 10 mistakes that you're making and give you no solutions. What we're actually going to look at is the mistakes and then how you overcome these mistakes, and it's much easier than you might imagine. So let's just check if you're in the right place. This is a webinar for you if, number one, your website just isn't working, or perhaps you've not even built a website yet and you're not quite sure where to start or what to do. Or perhaps you've got a website that's just not giving you the right impression for your business. It doesn't represent your brand in the best possible way. Or perhaps you have a lack of visitors to your website or quality visitors. Or perhaps you've got a low conversion of those visitors, as in low number of opt-ins or inquiries or sales. Or maybe a conglomeration of these issues. If you fall into any of those categories, then you are in the right place. Because as I say, we're going to look at the 10 areas that you can focus on. 10 mistakes you're probably making that we can overcome. Um, and I'm resolving your business. Now these are presented in no particular order and actually they're all about as important as each other but I've tried to um, I've tried to put them in a way that you can probably tackle them if you kind of pause this recording and go through and write them all down a kind of you know beginning middle and end so whilst I'm not saying that the first one is the biggest mistake and the tenth one is the tenth uh, biggest mistake. What I'm what I'm saying is that there's an order that you can follow. So don't worry too much about the order. But as you go through this, ask yourself: Am I committing this mistake? Am I making this mistake? And if the answer is yes, then don't lament and don't get sad about it. Don't get worried about it. All you need to do is change. And I'm going to give you easy ways to change. Okay, so let's have a look at the first one. The first one I've entitled: What are we doing? This is kind of lack of strategy. Now. Something weird happens with people's websites. If I was to ask you to send out an email or to write an advert or to do a direct mailer or something like this, you would say to me, the first question, well, you know, what, what are we selling and who are we selling it to? What are we promoting and to whom are we promoting it? But when it comes to websites, this just goes completely out the window and people completely forget this point and seem to write a website either with nobody in mind, so I'm not quite sure... Yeah, who am I in the right place? Is this a website for me? What am I trying to do here? I don't really understand. You know, I've read this website for a couple of minutes and I still don't get what you do. So it's kind of almost appealing to nobody, or worse still, it's appealing to everybody. And I have my website and it's got 110 messages. I don't know whether I'm in the right place. I don't know what you do. I don't know what's going on. Now, that's mistake number one. And the way to overcome this is to almost do what I call the 10 second rule. And the 10 second rule is to say, when I arrive on your website, can I answer these three questions within 10 seconds? Which is, am I in the right place? What do these people do? And what do I do next? Okay? And if you can't, you know, a visitor, if a visitor can't answer those questions within 10 seconds of being in the right place, what does this company do? Is it for me? And what do I do next? Within 10 seconds, you've lost them. Now, 99% of websites fail on this test. So kind of implementation point number one is to resolve that. When people are having a website, they want to know, okay, is this for me? Do I know what they do? What do I do next? And how do I get more involved? Quick bits of information. So do this with an exact target market in mind. Like I said, if I asked you to make a phone call or write a mail or do an advert, you'd say, okay, well, what are we promoting and who are we promoting it to? Do exactly the same with your website. So that's strategy point number one. Be clear for whom you're building the website, who your target market is. Okay, the next strategic mistake is not understanding what the purpose of a website is. Now, you can have an e-commerce website, but there are only 1% or 2% of websites. In the main, websites can be either an online brochure or a lead generation website. And there's a fundamental difference between the two. An online brochure is when people check you out. So they have a look at your business, so they may have... 
you know, received a phone call from you, may have received a recommendation, may have received some direct mail or something like this from you, and they check you out and they have a look around and they want to know, well, who is this business? Is it right for me? What's the pricing point? What are the services or what are the products? Who else do they work with? What are their extra resources? Can I find out about the people involved? Can I look at some of their resources or something that they've produced and, you know, can I check them out where their offices are? All of that sort of stuff. Now, lead generation is similar in the respect that it will do all of the stuff that I've just mentioned, but it will also generate inquiries. Now, later on, I think it's point number five, I'm going to give you a way to overcome that. But it's very important in the beginning that you understand, do you have a brochure website where you're just providing information and it's a bit like the old glossy brochures you used to print, where people are just flicking through the pages and just getting a general feel for your business because they're going to have a meeting with you anyway, or they're going to have a phone call with you, or they're going to make an inquiry, or they've been recommended? Or are they brand new people who are checking you out, but they're, they're a lot more cautious, they don't really know what's going on, and you need to generate a lead from them, otherwise those people will disappear. Whereas the person that's going to have a meeting with you anyway or has been recommended to you, they're just checking you out. And unless you do something wrong, they will continue on their journey. It's a bit of a checkout point. They just need to double check you're right. Whereas lead generation, they're not prospects, they're suspects. They're people who really aren't quite sure about your business. And with those people, we have to capture their details, otherwise they disappear. Now, like I say, I'm going to address that in a later slide, but I just want to flag it up now that for most websites, you've got to do both. You've got to satisfy those people checking you out, but you've also got to get those people, those suspecting people, those people who aren't so sure about you, and capture their details and start to build a relationship with them. The next kind of strategic point is a lack of process. I often say a website needs a beginning a middle and an end. If it doesn't have a beginning, a middle and an end, then what tends to happen is people aren't quite sure what they're supposed to do on your website. Now, people will arrive on different points in your website. They might arrive on any page that you're promoting or that you've optimised, but fundamentally they want to know, well, what do I do first? What do I do next? And then what's the final point? Now, in the beginning, I usually say that's the realisation phase. That's the stuff I've mentioned about is this for me? What do these people do? Do they do it with clients like me or customers like me? And, you know, is it right? And that's a kind of very quick, am I in the right place? That's the beginning phase. So structure your website so all of that beginning information is readily available so without any scroll above the folders, we call it, above the point at which you need to scroll down on your, um, on your mouse to go down the page and give them that information so they can figure out, do I want to find out more? That's the beginning. The middle is more detail. Let's drill down more into the services you offer. Let's drill down into more of the type of customers and case studies you've got. Let's find out about more about the people who are involved. All of those exploratory points, those information points. That's a beginning. So they come next on the website. So you check it out quickly, and then if I still like it, I'm going to scroll, and I'm going to find out more. And then the end is a call to action. Now, that leads me to my final point, which is kind of the strategic mistake, you know, 101 with websites, which is no call to action, because most people do the beginning bit quite well, and they'll do the middle bit but quite well, and then people just go, well, that was interesting, and they don't do anything else because there's no clear call to action. You must make them do something next, otherwise they will just disappear. Unless it's those brochure people who are checking you out anyway, and it's just a checkpoint, or those suspecting people, they will just disappear. They have good intentions of going, well, this is great, I'll come back and I'll make an inquiry, but they never do. Now, again, that's something I'm going to flag up in the next couple of um, next couple of slides, but I just want to almost state these strategic challenges because these are really the reasons why most people's websites aren't working. And most people believe it's because, you know, their, their website doesn't work well in terms of features or it doesn't look very good or the wording's wrong and that sort of stuff. All of that's important and we're going to come on to all of that. But actually, strategically, that's the real challenge for most websites. And it's because they've not got the strategic stuff right. That's the real reason that they're failing. So to recap, mistake number one, what are we doing? Get your strategy right. Number one, have a clear target market in mind. This is the person who's arriving on my website. It's this person with this problem. They need this service at this price point, and this is what we're going to do next. Be able to answer those questions very, very quickly, very immediately. 
build your website with that very clear target market in mind exactly the same as when you write an email or you do a telephone call or you send out a mailer or you produce an advert or whatever okay next one is lead generation make sure you got a brochure website so people can check you out but remember most people visiting your website are suspects it's their first visit and if you don't create a, a lead if you don't generate an inquiry or an opt-in or something of that ilk then somebody will disappear and they'll never ever come back so it'll be their first and only visit so make sure you attend to those two it's got to be a brochure but that's only the beginning okay and most people they believe that's the only purpose of a website make sure you resolve that one the next one's a process I want the beginning information to start with that's right there in front of me I don't have to hunt for it straight in front of me easy digestible got it checkpoint am I in the right place yes or no if it's a yes then all the middle information all of the extra information about the company what you do and we'll come on to how you develop that in later slides and then the end a clear call to action if you're not doing that you're losing out on so much because you'll have all of these visitors and they get themselves all worked up and they're really excited and really want to do business with you but you don't give them a choice as to what to do next all they can do is disappear and come back another time and we can't have people doing that so we'll look at how you resolve all of those in the next couple of slides but this is kind of strategy 101 absolutely make sure you're clear on this point so that was mistake number one let's have a look at mistake number two okay I've called this one home from home and this is something which um, it kind of links to what I was just saying there about the strategy and this is a strategic point that not everybody who arrives on your website will arrive on the home page now what most people do is they pay great attention to making their website homepage look absolutely beautiful and most people achieve it actually most people's homepages look pretty good I've reviewed literally thousands of websites and the homepage is generally alright then I click on another page and it all goes downhill and it kind of falls apart and it's absolutely awful remember not everybody's gonna arrive on your homepage because of the way that you do search engine optimization because of the way you do search marketing or because of the way you promote a website you're often pointing people to a particular page they will find your website different pages so every page needs to be like a home page so remember what I said before about a clear target market in mind a beginning a middle and an end you need to do all of that in every single page so what does that really mean number one remember the home page isn't the sort of the, you know the only home page every page is a home page every page is an arrival page so for every target market that you have or every service or product that you provide make sure you have a different page for all of those a different arrival page so let's say you do services for accountants and lawyers and IT companies you need to make sure that you have a home page that deals with all of them maybe have a little boxes pointing those three target markets off but you also have an arrival page for accountants for lawyers and for IT people and then if you have product A B and C the same again don't fall into this mistake of having a fantastic home page it gets people excited but it's only if they look at it and then every other page falls down So that's point number one the second one is make sure every page is designed well and has the right layout People often have really good navigation on their home page and really good design on their home page, as I've said, but it doesn't continue throughout the website. Every page must look as good as the home page and the layout must make it easy for them to navigate around. Almost ask yourself, for every single page you publish on your website, could somebody find their way around um, to every other page from this page? And if they can't and they can only do that from the home page, you need to update that. The next one is the general introduction to the business on every page. And that's a bit of a mouthful, but what I mean by that is because people aren't necessarily arriving on your homepage, they don't know all of that initial information. Who you are, what you do, who you do it for, what the kind of price point is, what type of business this is. You need to have that general introduction on every page. My general recommended way to overcome that is to have everything encapsulated into an explainer video a kind of you know 90 second two minute introduction to your business and then put that on every page you can also support it with a written box saying about us but make sure that's on every single page because remember most of your traffic isn't there on the home page the final one is a call to action on every page I said this in the first point this is absolutely crucial every page must have a call to action it must be very clear what I need to do next to progress with your business and I'm gonna come on to the different types of call to action in a little bit but that's mistake number two the third mistake is layout doesn't work I generally find that websites are either overly designed you're trying a bit too hard and it ends up looking a bit scruffy and a bit confused and a bit ham almost 
Um, or they're under-designed, and it's very minimalistic, but I don't really quite know what's going on, and the design integrity kind of falls apart. So I've got a bit of a checklist here that I'm going to come through, and this is what you need to do on every page of your website. Make sure, number one, it has b sort of basic design features. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean that you've got a clear header, so it explains who you are and what you do, and it's got some contact details, then a clear navigation, and then it's in a modular fashion, so it's quite clear what information you're providing, how I find out other information, and then some general information about the company, and then a call to action. Every page needs to have that. Also needs to have relevant in imagery. Now, occasionally you can get rid of imagery. It's not always, you know, absolutely essential. But I would say 90% of the time you probably want to have an image on your website page so it kind of explains the story. You know that idea about a picture, you know, tells a, a, a thousand words and tells a story. That's what you need to do with relevant imagery. And I generally think that um, imagery is a way of kind of breaking up the text and supporting the design features as well. So make sure that your imagery matches your general design. I think of the design as the skin of the website, the kind of outfit of the website, and you need to make sure that all the imagery kind of suits with that, so the same feel and the same style. The next one's coherent brand colours. An awful lot of businesses, I go onto their homepage and it's pink because their company is pink. And then their inner pages, there's no pink at all, it's black and white. Make sure you have consistent colours throughout, and that, that kind of links to the design features and that kind of design integrity. I've mentioned this one already, but modular design. The reason I recommend modular design is because I believe it's easier for everybody to look at. If you put it into three different columns, it's quite easy for me to figure out information A, information B, information C. And that's kind of nice and easy. It also helps with mobile responsiveness, which I'm going to come on to, I think, in point number um, 9 or 10. Also be easy to use navigation. As I said in the first point, a lot of people arrive on the website on different pages and it's hard for them to navigate around and figure out where they should be. So kind of ease of navigation is really important. Make sure from any page on the website you can find any other page within a couple of clicks. If you can't do that, it's too hard. And remember this golden rule of websites. If you make your website visitor work too hard, they will go elsewhere. If somebody goes to a normal shop, you know, a kind of bricks and mortar shop, they're likely to have a look around and if they can't find what they want, they'll probably ask somebody or they'll look on the shelves themselves. That's what we do. With websites, it's completely different. We hit the back button and go, well, there's at least another hundred businesses doing this, so I'll go and have a look at another one. So make sure that ease of navigation is there. Remember how fickle website visitors are. They're terribly fickle and you have to make sure you make everything so easy for them. Next one is a readable font. This seems so silly, doesn't it? Me saying, make sure your website's readable. You would be surprised the number of websites I read. And, you know, I've got pretty good eyesight. Every time I go to the opticians, they say, you've got fine eyesight. You don't need glasses or any of this sort of stuff. And I'm reading people's websites and I'm, I'm having to squint and I can't quite see it. Well, if I can't really read it and I've got good eyesight, what about members of your target market with bad eyesight and also it just makes it it's unpleasant and people don't want that type of experience so break it up big headlines nice sub headlines and then content which is justified and readable and easy on the eye remember what I said they're fickle and they'll disappear final point is about design integrity and stylishness to some extent this is just a bit of a power adjective you know about integrity and stylishness you know it, it's difficult to actually convert that into practical advice because you know, a bit like with design features, I can tell you how to make it look, but really that's whether you've got the artistic eye or not. Uh, but just make sure that you look at it and you say to yourself, yes, this is integral, this is whole, this makes sense, it looks stylish, it befits my brand. You wouldn't have a shop front, if you had a shop front business, with a sort of tacky sign that looked a load of rubbish. But that's what people do on their, home, uh, on their website pages other than their homepage. Make sure you don't do that. Make sure the page is a stylish pa place to be, the kind of place I want to be. Okay, number four then. Content is king. An old phrase, but a very important phrase, and it really does apply to websites. Now, a lot of people, if they were writing an email, or they were doing an advert, or something like this, they pay great attention to the words. But when it comes to their website, they just put um, not so much a lack of information, but just badly written, couldn't really be bothered, they thought they paid somebody to build a website, and then realised they had to go and write it themselves, and it, it just undermines absolutely everything. 
So here's a bit of a checklist of, uh, of things you can do to make sure your content is perfect. And if you're not doing all of these, and you can't put a tick against all of these on the screen now, then you're doing something wrong, and you will be, I can absolutely guarantee, losing potential customers and potential inquiries and potential opt-ins because you're not doing this. So here we are. Content is king checklist. First one, words and video. Multimedia. It's no longer good enough just to have words and images on a website page. People want a video. Why? If you take a hundred random people and you say to these hundred random people, would you rather watch television or read a book? Most of them will say they'll watch television. I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm not saying, you know, TV's better than books. Body, body, body. I'm not saying any of that. But what I am saying is most people are are more inclined to watch video because it's easier. We've been preconditioned to watch television over reading. So, if that's true, if people would rather a video format, why when I go onto a website page don't I have the option to have a little bit of a video content as well as words? Why can't I make that choice? If people are preconditioned and like video, make it there and available for them. So number one, make sure you have that multimedia, some words and some video. And people are very sophisticated now on websites, they're perfectly capable of playing a video, maybe it's a bit of an explainer about what you do, and then skim reading at the same time. We know people do that from the kind of study of, um, of website people's behaviour and what they do on the website page. So number one, words and video, multimedia, and combine them with imagery. The next one is a brand slogan. Every business should have a slogan. You know, we, we say we unlock the hidden potential in your business. Make sure that's visible on every page because if it isn't visible, your tagline isn't there. And the whole point of having a tagline, the whole point of a brand slogan, is that it's a repeated message that communicates your unique selling point and is a direct kind of sell to people. So make sure that's there either in the copy or somewhere within your design features. The next one is headlines. This is such a quick win. So many people on the website don't have headlines. You would not send a direct mail letter or an email without a headline. You just wouldn't do that. You you know you go go to the back of a class if you did that. You just that's unacceptable. People just don't make that mistake. But they do when it comes to the websites. I want a headline. I want a subheadline. Then I want copy and I want bullet points and I want justified copy. I want it to look professional. Make sure you use headlines. Headlines are so powerful. We all know that people you know, look at the headline and only 20% um, of people read the rest of the copy. You know, 80% of people read the headline and make a decision and disappear. Make sure you have a very good headline so you can change those statistics. The next one's about your unique selling point. I believe every business needs to have a unique selling point that expands upon their brand slogan that explains what they do, who they do it for, what the results are, and the process that they deliver. Make sure that's there. A lot of people complain to me that they've become commoditized. The problem with the internet, whilst it connects you with a potential of, you know, what is it, two, three billion people, that's fantastic, but the biggest problem is you're commoditized and people can just press the back button. I've said this to you in this webinar. People are very fickle. They'll press the back button and go and find somebody else more interesting. Now, the way you overcome that is to stop yourself being commoditized by saying, hey, we're not like everybody else. We're different. We have a unique process for a unique target market, and this is how it works. Then follow that up with benefits. Remember what I'm always saying. Features tell, benefits sell. Make sure on every page of your website, and this is, this is not exactly an exact formula, but I quite like this. Make sure you've got about 10 benefits. If you can have 10 discernible benefits, they could be bullet points, they could be a top 10, or they could just be laden throughout the text. But if you have at least 10 benefits of why your target market should work with you, that's 10 reasons for somebody to say, you know what, you've resonated with me, I'm getting in touch. And remember, that's the whole point of a website. The whole point of your website is for people to look at it and to say, you know what, you've just said something, and that's what, what I was looking for. You've pressed my, you know, my kind of, um, my buttons, you've kind of enticed me, and you, you, you know, I've got a problem, and you've got the resolution. You've, you've kind of identified my unmet need, and benefits is how you do that. You do that through the benefit-driven um, copy. So I often say, if, you know, it's a bit of an acid test, is the 10 there? As I say, it's not an exact formula or anything like this, but I just think that if you say 10, that gives you 10 opportunities. Well, 10 is better than 5, isn't it? Great, if you can get 20, do 20. But I think it's a good starting point for most copy. Next one is one of my favourites, a guarantee. 
As I say, the internet is a commoditized place. There's so many other people on the internet now. So many other people to choose from. Why should I choose you over everybody else? Well, because you're prepared to be bold and to guarantee what you do. It's no longer good enough, I don't believe, to say, I've got a great business and I provide this product or service for this target market at this price point and these are the outcomes you will receive. Anybody can say that. Talk is cheap. Guarantee your results. We've talked about guarantees before. I've produced webinars and guarantees before. If you're not so sure, revisit those. But a guarantee is essentially when you say, yeah, these are the results you're looking for. This is your unmet need. We're guaranteed to meet that. And if you can have a guarantee on a website that's there, very bold, maybe even incorporated into your USP process or your brand slogan in that kind of beginning messaging that I talked about, talked about before, how powerful is that? What does that say to somebody? It says this business is so good they're prepared to guarantee their results. Does that look like a business that you are more likely to trust, more likely to get in touch with? Somebody you're more likely to say, I'm making an inquiry, I'm not going anywhere else. Because why would I want to go to anywhere else? Because these people have guaranteed their results. Incredibly powerful and only done by 0.1% of businesses. I don't understand why it's not more and nobody on this webinar has any excuse now not to do this. So please take account of this guarantees there's such a fantastic remedy to this commoditized business place hundreds and hundreds of websites maybe even thousands of websites in your particular industry out there on the internet you can become one of the few if not the only one that's guaranteeing your results how powerful is that Next one is linked to um, the benefits and the guarantees really it's kind of sales barriers I often say to people don't tell me just the benefits of what you do, but also tell me some of the downsides that people have, some of the doubting questions people have. So not, you know, will you do X for me, but will Y happen? Yeah, you know, well, you say this, but what about this? You say that I can get X outcome, but oh, what if this happens? What if that happens? All of those doubting questions. I would often put those either into a frequently asked questions and say, you know, these are all the concerns people have, so I'll knock down all of those sales barriers. That's what we call them. When somebody is worried uh, that something's going to happen, it's a barrier to sale because I'm worried that I won't get my chosen outcome because of a sales barrier. Now, a guarantee is a great way of knocking those down, but you probably don't want to, or you probably can't practically guarantee absolutely everything. So either frequently asked questions, very useful, or just weave it into the copy. Maybe it's very specific, uh, very specific points um, in relation to uh, to that particular product or service. But, you know, benefits are fantastic. They're incredibly powerful, but also have those doubting questions. Ah, you say this, but what about this? Next one is social proof. Another one of these quick wins. I don't think that really you necessarily need to just have a testimonials button anymore. I think what better way of doing it than in your kind of about us or this particular product or this particular service, why not include some of your social proof there? Social proof is simply saying, here are people like you. You're reading this because you've got a particular problem, particular unmet need, and that's what we do. And here are some people who look, sound, act, and are like you. They have this problem, and this is how we help them resolve it. Much more powerful than what you say. Because any website can be very bold. And yeah, it's great if they guarantee the results. But sometimes there can still be some doubts. But if you can say, well, here's 10 people who were just like you. And look what they had to say. And here's a video of them. Or here's a picture of them. Here's their name, their company, their town. And you've got that social proof. It's very effective. And next, call to action. I'm not going to mention that anymore because I've mentioned it an awful lot. But if any page on your website doesn't have that, there's a serious problem. We're going to look at different calls to action very shortly. Okay then, number five, make me an offer. This is kind of challenge number five, is basically data capture is missing. To explain to you what data capture is, data capture is when you say, I'd like to make you an offer. I would like you to join my community. I'd like you to touch base and get in touch with us and actually kind of connect with us. You generally do that through a data capture box. We can have all different shapes and sizes, but fundamentally they say, here's an offer. Tell us your name, maybe your email, maybe your phone number, maybe more details, maybe a message, and get in touch. And there's lots of different ways you can do that, but it's fundamentally making an offer to people because, and look at this kind of ABC kind of format, I came to your website because I wanted to know more about your business. I wanted to find out what you do. And I still want to know more as I'm nearly ready to buy, and I'm at that point where I need to buy, but... I've still got some information that's going around in my head. 
Now the bridge between this, point number C, is data capture. You say, I understand that you're more progressed than just wanting general information. You got to the point where you want to know more. You still want to know more, but you're more ready to buy. You kind of progress from point A to point B. So the, the kind of bridge for, the, to, to you and then making the ultimate sale is to say data capture. Now the different types of data capture you can have it, it are many and varied. There's, there's literally you know thousands of different ways you can do this. But the most popular are, number one, callback. So enter your details and somebody get in touch. Or a contact us form. Or a make an inquiry form. Or maybe you'll say here's some free information we'll give you. Maybe we'll give you some product samples or some service samples or some free resources or extra information. Maybe you can opt in and become a member of our community and we'll share resources with you. Whatever's relevant to your business, then you will, um, you will know, but that's what you need to do. You could also have a seasonal offer or a very special offer. You could say, well, these are discounted or this is a lot leader or this is a particular promotion that's per perfect for a particular niche or a particular time of year or a time limited offer. All of these, again, we've done lots of stuff on special offers before. Revisit that content if you're not too sure what I'm talking about. But every page must say this. When you get people to that point of saying, I came here because I wanted to know more. I now know more, but I want to know a bit more because I'm at that buying stage, but I've got all of these questions because that's what we do we don't very often say I've read some information and I'm absolutely certain that I want to buy from you so I'll make an inquiry most people say I think I'm ready to buy but I still want to know more all the emails we get and all the phone calls we get from people on our website always follow this format while well, I was having a look at your website and I was interested in this and it sounds like it's good for me but, and there's always a but, no matter how good our copy is, no matter how effective it is, there's always that but. But I wanted to know X, Y, Z. Well, make sure that you give people the opportunity to get in touch with you, to connect, join your community so you can resolve that particular point. As I've said, there's a multiplicity of ways that you can do that, but there are people who always follow that format. They're never ready just to buy straight now, unless it's an e-commerce website. That's not really the purpose of the webinar. This is kind of general business websites trying to generate inquiries, and people will always say, I think I'm ready, but I've got questions. It's just kind of the way we do stuff. For some reason, when we walk around a retail store, we're more than happy to put stuff in our trolley and push it around and kind of go to the checkout and buy it. But for some reason, when it comes to a website, we're never quite so sure. Maybe it's because it's not physical and we've not really met somebody. And we've not pressed for flesh and it doesn't quite seem real that we want to know some more information. It might be virtually, that's fine by our email and a bit of a dialogue, but we always have these questions. Make it really easy for people to do that, and it's an absolute dream. It just works so effectively. The number of people we've had who've come through different data capture boxes on different web pages, on different people's websites, lots of different clients, is incredible. There's one client we had, well, we do have, who had had a website for a couple of years, and the website was pretty good, but they had zero inquiries, literally zero, you know, not one inquiry and we just added a data capture box. We improved a few other bits as well, but fundamentally, the, the, the kind of, the beef of it was we put a data capture box, and within the space of about a couple of days, that had seven inquiries for an expensive service straight away. What had been happening for the last couple of years, so many people had been interested, so many people had been ready to make an inquiry, but because there's no data capture, there's no bridge, it may disappear. So make sure you have this on every single page of your website. Okay, mistake number six is not having the right balance of traffic drivers. Now, I could do a webinar on any one of these points. I could probably do a hundred webinars on any one of these points because they're such massive areas. However, mo most people say one of the biggest problems I've got with my website is I don't have enough visitors or more importantly, enough quality visitors, the right type of people who are interested, my target market. So very quickly, I'm going to tell you the different ways you can do that. And if you're not putting a tick against all five of these in your business, I'm pretty certain that, that that you're making a mistake, and you could be. Obviously, all differences, are, all businesses are different, but there is really no excuse for people not doing this. So, point number one: search marketing. People type stuff into Google. For the vast majority of businesses, people will be typing stuff into Google, and they can find you. For some businesses, it may be more lateral than other businesses, but people are typing stuff into Google to find you. Make sure you have search marketing tactics. Might be pay per click, might be SEO, might be directories, that sort of stuff, so that people can find your website. That's entry point number one. 
Entry point number two is dynamic advertising. That means that you profile the type of places people go on the internet. So it might be that you know people are interested because you've got a suit shop and people type in new suit into Google. Fantastic. But you also know the people who wear your suits are business people. And business people go to a business forum website. And you can advertise on that website saying, hey, how about having a new suit? Now, it may not have occurred to them that they wanted a new suit, but when they see your fantastic advert and it takes them to a brilliant website, they might just buy your suit. It's not good enough just to rely on search traffic. If people are at other places on the website where your target market are, make sure you connect them to your website. The next one is direct drivers. This is very important. This is a way of targeting individual people or a targeted number of people and driving them straight to your website. Emails and social media promotions are kind of the most popular ones of these. So essentially, if, if, if you look at how that differs, the first one people are typing it into Google to find you. The next one's people are browsing on websites which are relevant to your target market and then they find your advertisement and come to your website. The next one is they get an email or they see a post and that's a target audience that drives them to a the website. The next one is kind of other people's traffic, piggybacking on other people. Joint ventures. Who has a list of people that you could make contact with and say, you're interested in, in what we do and you could you could essentially buy our products and services come and visit our website the best joint ventures people uh, so the joint venture partners are people who have the same target market but have a different product or service so who out there sells stuff to the same customers as you but isn't a competitor and you can have a joint venture arrangement maybe you might just swap lists and share it that way maybe you'll pay them a commission or a, or, a, or a list fee promotional fee list rental something like that many different ways of doing it but who else has got thousands of people who are your target market and how could you get them onto your website again that differs to the other strategies you can also have referral offers so getting your existing customers to endorse you or endorse traffic a little bit more of an advanced tactic but essentially this is when the joint venture partners, they themselves drive traffic straight to your website rather than you making contact with them. Slight, slight difference there, but essentially um, two sides of the same coin. The next one is what I call the offline to online switch. Essentially, this is when you say, well, you know, I'm already catering for people typing stuff into Google and I get them. I'm also catering for people who go to websites that are relevant to what I do and relevant to my target market and I get them. And I also identify the type of people I'd like to be working with and I do social media promotions to them and I also email them. Then I also find other people who know people um, that, that I'd like to have cu as customers and they come to my website. But you say that's not good enough because that's all the internet. I want to get people who are offline who aren't looking at the internet and then get them to my website. Two classic ways of doing this. The first one is direct mail. It generally works better with a postcard. So let's say you've got a fantastic promotion for your new suit. So I'm going to use that example of a suit shop. And you say, okay, the people who wear suits are, um, I don't know, um, let, let's say um, I mentioned before professional people. So professional services. And then you send it to professional service people saying, we've got a great suit promotion. Go to our website. They're not people who would have necessarily found you on the internet. It works brilliantly for those people who aren't so up on the internet because don't forget there's lots of people who don't spend all day on social media and emails and all that sort of stuff. If you run a business and you're listening to this webinar, the chances are you spend all day in front of a computer doing stuff because that's what you know running a business is all about. But there's lots of people who aren't quite so obsessed. They're on the internet, but they don't spend all day there. So a direct mail to them or advertising. So when people are flicking through a newspaper, they see a billboard, they watch something on TV, they listen to something on the radio, um, they consume something in the trade press, something like that. And you say, go to our website and then, then kind of make an inquiry. The reason this works much better in most cases, not all cases, but most cases, is because if you've just got a postcard or particularly an advert, you're limited by space and engagement time. Whereas when you put them on a website, there's so much more you can do. And don't forget, they then come into your funnel where you can do data capture or you can convince them with lots of different pages and you've got all of your different options like the, co the content we mentioned and the guarantees and the USBs and the processes and all of that sort of stuff. You can throw so much more at them on a website because they'll click around lots of different pages and consume all of this different information. Whereas with a postcard and particularly an advert, you're limited in what you can do. There's also the more advanced tactics, which I'm going to come on to next, that you could never do with an advert and a postcard which I'll come on to. If your business, as I say, isn't taking advantages, advantage of all five of these, you're probably missing out. So, you know, can you tick against all of these? And if you can't, that's a very quick win for you to develop that strategy. 
Okay, mistake number seven is assuming that stalking is illegal. Actually, on the internet, stalking is now illegal. What do I mean by that? Well, reference my comments about data capture. This is how the internet works. About 50% of people, no matter how good your website are, will bounce off in about 8 seconds. About half of the people will just disappear. And maybe that's good. You don't want the wrong type of people reading your website, consuming your information, making inquiries and wasting your time. So, you know, there's no golden rule and if you can get it lower than 50%, fantastic. But, you know, just expect about half your visitors, if you're doing everything right, to disappear. 1% of those people will actually make an inquiry. So that accounts for 51% of people. And then if you're being really clever and you're doing all the great data capture stuff I've talked about, you can increase that fivefold. So actually, for every one person that makes an inquiry or a sale, actually five, five um, people will go for data capture. So that accounts for 56%. What happens to the other 44%? They're not the people who disappeared, they didn't make an inquiry, didn't go for data capture, which is kind of a one step below uh, making an inquiry or making, uh, placing an order. Well, they are the people who don't get round to it. And this is what I said before, that if you don't do data capture and other features, what happens is people say, this is great, I'm really interested, and ask yourself, have you done this? When you're on internet uh, websites, you, you'll say, oh, that's really interesting, I'm, uh, you know, this is great, I'm going to buy from this, but, you know, I'm not going to get round to it yet because, you know, it's late at night or I'm not quite ready. All of these weird excuses we all come up with, then we disappear and then we'll never find that website ever again. And if we do want that service again, we'll probably Google it, find another website, and that's it, we've lost for sale. So what do you do about those 44% of people who, if they didn't disappear, they consumed your content, but just weren't quite ready for data capture or website inquiry? Well, what you do with these people is you stalk them. What do I mean by that? Well, we can now do three different things. We can do what's known as remarketing advertising, retargeting activities, and dynamic approaches. Now, what does that mean? Well, remarketing is simply a way, and I won't go into the technical stuff, but you basically pop a bit of code on your website, and you say, everybody visited my website. What we're going to do is we're going to run banner adverts to them as they go around the million or so partner websites in the display network on the internet, as they go around, so let's say onto YouTube, then we run an advert to them and say, hey, remember you on our website, remember you were interested, we'll come back for some more. This is incredibly cheap and it's incredibly targeted. It's the best type of advertising you can run because it says, I know you are interested, I know you've got a need, but for some reason you didn't make an inquiry, come back again. That's remarketing. Retargeting is a little bit different. You can do this in a couple of different ways. The main way is you can actually say not just websites like YouTube and that sort of stuff, but when we're on social media websites, so when we're on Facebook, for instance, we can even run advertisements there. How clever is that? I've been on your website, I was interested, but like 44% of people, I just didn't do anything about it. I was going to get round to it, but I didn't. So I can see some of your adverts and I can go onto YouTube, but then when I go onto Facebook and spend all these hours, you know, sharing pictures and chatting and all of this sort of stuff, I can actually see your advertisements, another way of getting them. The final one is Dynamics. This is where it gets a lot more complicated, but very briefly, what you can do here is you can say, okay, I'm going to be really clever. I'm not just saying, hey, remember me, this is our website. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, you were on my suit shop website and you looked at black suits, which are expensive. So I'm going to run an advertisement to you saying, hey, here are great black suits, which are expensive. Or maybe you looked at blue suits, which are cheaper. Or here are blue economy suits. So you actually match the type of pages people were on with the type of advertisements they see. So you're not just saying, hey, come back to our general website. You're saying, hey, you were interested in black quality suits. Get back onto that page for a nice black quality suit. Use all of these together. But this is so effective because, as I say, if you use data capture, which is all we used to be able to do up to a couple of years ago, you can increase the number of people who are interested fivefold. That's brilliant, but it still leaves that 44% who didn't bounce off, but didn't do anything else. Retargeting is a brilliant way of very inexpensively promoting to people that you know are interested and have a need but haven't quite done anything about it and bringing them back to your website. Make sure you're doing this. There's absolutely no excuse for not doing this. No excuse whatsoever. The next one is kind of the other side of this coin. Uh, mistake number uh, number eight is kind of presuming that there's a hiding place. You don't just have to promote to them online. 
with website visitor identification software, which I consider to now be absolutely essential on business websites, you can now identify in real time who's on your website, their company name, what's their address, what's their telephone number, what's their email, what's all their background information, what can I find out about this, this company, what's their website, what's, what's their online PR like, what are they all about. And then I can also figure out what pages on my website did they visit. Um, how many times have they been on the website? What pages did they look at in what order? How long did they spend on a page? And crucially, where's the exit point? So let me give you an example. You're a suit website, and then you realize that ABC um, Professional Services Limited is on your website. And you find out their name and their address and their phone number and email so you can contact them via post, via telephone, via email or any other way that you can choose of because you've got all that information. And you know that they looked at your blue suits and your black suits, you're cheap and you're expensive. And then they clicked onto the shoes page and they spent five minutes browsing your great shoes but for some reason they disappeared. Get in touch with them and say, how about it? You're obviously interested in shoes. These are all the shoes we have and this is how they link to our suits. How powerful is that? Tell me why you wouldn't be doing that. Give me a credible reason why a business wouldn't want to know in real time who's on the website, everything about that business, all their pages, all their search history, what they were looking at and when they disappeared off the website. How valuable is that? That's absolutely incredible. And so few people are doing this. Of course, as you probably know from the way I'm talking, that's only available for business-to-business -business services. So obviously we can only identify business visitors, so basically people with a traceable IP address, for members of the general public for privacy law and all of that sort of stuff. But if you're business-to-business, -business, I just can't see why you wouldn't be doing this. Use it in combination with your remarketing, retargeting, and dynamic uh, re-approaches. Re so that's number eight. You know, there are no hiding places anymore. Okay, the ninth point is a simple one. I won't spend too long on this. I just want to flag this up as a very common mistake. People believe their website is a kind of absolute destination, but it isn't. It's a journey. When you build a website, you must then in incorporate analytics. You must review your analytics every day and say, great, we've built a website. Now, what are people doing? So let's create a page that's a great promotion. So that's testing something. Step number eight. Then step number B is to measure your results. What's happening on this page? And then adapt accordingly. So if, if the sales are too low, well, let's do something differently to improve that. If that increases sales, continue on that journey. If sales are high, so how could we get them even higher? Or how could we replicate this? Because maybe this page is really working really well for our blue suits. Let's do exactly the same for our black suits and for our ties and for our shoes and all the rest of it. So just remember, when you're building your website, the most common mistake people make is assuming that you've built it, job done, ticking the box. If you're going to do that, you're only ever going to get about 10 to 10, 20 percent of your website. Whenever we work with people over a long period of time, and we build them a website, and then we develop it over time, all of the kind of results, 80 percent of the results, come later on as you get better and better and better. Exactly the same as if you were sending an email. You wouldn't just send out one email, never split test anything else, and assume that's enough. So why would you do that with a website? So test, measure, and adapt is an absolute essential. Okay, the tenth point is saying the future is here. Here I'm just really flagging up some stuff which, you know, is now 2014 and you can't be putting this off. Here's a fact. Your customers are using mobile phones. I don't know any business out there whose customers don't use mobile phones. They might not use mobile phones as their primary way of looking at your business, but you still need to have a website which is visible and friendly to mobile phones and also tablet computers. So because your customers are using them, you need to. So what does that mean? That means you need to build your website to have what's known as mobile and tablet responsiveness. So they work perfectly on phones. So when people check out your website on their phone or on their tablet, it doesn't look weird. It's designed in a technical way so that it's responsive, that's the technical term, on mobiles and tablets. Whilst you're there, all of your customers will be using social media. So make sure that your website interact with your social media function. So what you're doing on Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and YouTube links back to your website and vice versa. Again, it's 2014. You can't keep telling people, oh, well, our people aren't on social media. You know, there isn't a business out there that doesn't have potential in social media. This is being used by, you know, 
what is it, Facebook has got over a billion users. Are you telling me you can't identify some customers in there? I don't believe it. And finally, people are now using apps. They're very popular. That's what people are doing. When It's not just good enough to have a mobile responsive website. People also want an app and want to interact with you in that way. So like I say, it's 2014. Make sure you're paying attention to these advanced features. Once upon a time, and I built my first website in 1998, and I can remember it, a website was the Holy Grail. And then we started to do lots of other bits and pieces, whereas now you look at a website and it's used in conjunction with, conjunction with your email marketing, your other marketing strategies, your offline marketing strategies, your online advertising, your online promotion, all of the search marketing, and then mobile and tablet sort of stuff, your apps and your social media. It's all kind of all come together as one holistic strategy, so make sure that you're, you're using all of that. Okay then, so that is, um, in you know just under an hour, the 10 most common mistakes people make with your website. Hopefully from this webinar you can tell there's loads of mistakes people make. That's to be expected. But the solution is really easy. On every single slide, I've given you really concrete solutions to these problems. And so many of these are absolutely no-brainers. If you've gone through every single one of these slides and, uh, and you're saying you're doing all of it, fantastic. But if it's even just one point that you're not doing, then you absolutely need to rectify that. I think for most people, they might be committing maybe five or more, maybe even all ten of these. Most people I speak to, to a greater or lesser extent, are actually committing all of these. So make sure you rectify that in your business. Now, of course, some of you might need more help. You might be going, well, how do I build a website like that? How do I do all of that search marketing? How do I do data capture? What's the right stuff to offer? How do I get this retargeting and re-advertising working? How do I do that identification? What does test measuring that mean and how do I do it? You know, how do I build a mobile responsive website? Any of those sorts of questions, please get in touch. That's what we do with people all the time. We connect people to their potential customers. We help them to get more customers, more sales and improve their business and the website's a very sort of you know obvious way that we do that so if you've got any more questions if we can help you in any other way please get in touch this is a general webinar for general business owners so i've made everything as generic and general as possible but obviously you'll have specific questions please get in touch you all have my email the phone and you can get in touch with us you know how to do that but please do use that so hopefully this has been useful. Please do give me some feedback. Whenever you're doing these webinars, all I can really see is that 99% um, of you have stayed online and you've not disappeared. Uh, but it's sometimes really good to have some positive feedback and just to know what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong. So do get in touch with us. Let us know if this has helped you, what you liked, what maybe we could do differently. Um, obviously, we'll have another webinar in a month's time. So hopefully you've enjoyed this one. Hopefully it's helped your business. And as I say, any questions you've got, please get in touch and we can help you some more in a more specific way. So, between now and the next time you hear from me, I hope you have an absolutely brilliant time in business. It's been a really good webinar to deliver. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. So I will speak to you all very soon. Goodbye for now.